Hi, my name is Michelle River. I am the owner of Erie River Publishing House. And we are here today with some fantastic authors that we have from our curated anthology um, from Beyond the Threshold. So this one was um, the brainchild of Tim Mendes. Um, he really wanted to put together a cosmic horror anthology, and I thought he was the perfect person um, to get this together. So we had over, um, I can't remember the exact number. We had hundreds of authors submit their stories, um, and we've got 12 different stories that are in this amazing collection, and we've got three of our fantastic authors here today. Now, Erie River Publishing is a small publishing house based out of Southern Ontario. My name is Michelle, and I am the owner, and we specialize in horror and dark fiction. Um, we do ebooks, paperbacks, and we also have some hardcover. Uh, we have anthologies, collections, novels, and novellas. So if you're looking where to find us, you can find us at Erie River everywhere. We're on TikTok. Ignore the cringe when you watch that. Um, we're on TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Instagram, we are at Erie underscore River because someone took the other name. But either way. Uh, we are here today with some fantastic authors and we are going to be, um, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce them one at a time, say hello, and then we're going to let, give them an opportunity to talk about their story and read from their book as well. So if anybody has any questions while um, they're reading, feel free to like make a comment or say hi, all that other fun stuff. We're here for you. Um, and hopefully you all enjoy. So let's start. We're going to be starting with Jonathan Hart. So Jonathan, are you ready? Yes, I got a thumbs up. There we are. So Jonathan, I have you. You did threefold dot WMV. Correct. How do you say that? I said that, is, that is the only way I've ever heard it. <laughs> well, like. People could say it the way that you don't want them to. Okay, so people could say it uh, threefold dot woomph. And <laughs> woomph. Yeah. And, that's uh, exactly how I would probably have pronounced it. That's fair. You can do that. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a free country, and uh, there's the GIF-GIF debate. So, you know. I know. I heard it's now GIF. Uh, I, th I think it always was GIF, but a lot of people called it GIF from the beginning and now yeah. they're not going to change it and everyone just kind of came oh, to accept it you know just realize what my mug said oh i i thought that was intentional and witty and funny like i made the mug it is my mug <laughs> i sell these mugs at f but i did not intentionally make it for this but yeah, I, that's OK. Um, I, I just want to say, uh, since this is my first time talking to you face to face, uh, you are an extremely nice person. And uh, like it, this has been shown in the emails that you've sent back and forth with me, like extensively. So oh. I do not think that you would be telling the audience or me to F off. I highly doubt that. Um, I mean, maybe like, like not on purpose and not without like humor behind it. OK, yeah. I, I accept this. I accept this and I, I consider it valid. <laughs> now I'm going to have to find my mug that's been like, be awesome today, just to like counter back, counter off like the fuck off mug that I just <laughs> dual <put> wield. <laughs> exactly. So you wrote. Me. <laughs> so we have your story in the anthology. Thank mm -hmm. you for calling me nice. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Like, I always have to make an ass of myself at least one point. So might as well do it right at the beginning. Um, so do you want to dive right into reading or what would you like to do? I would like to state a qualifier first, which is that uh, this is a story that takes place largely on the Internet. So it is screen friendly. Um, I'm not sure how reading friendly it is. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to try my best, but I will be reading yeah. screen names and the thing that the screen name says, and I will be doing that again and again, and I'll try to make it bearable if possible. That's um, do it. Okay. I, yeah. Awesome. Like I, I read it and I thought it would read pretty well. So I'm not overly that 
You know what? Their screen names are pretty intense, so. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, like, I guess uh, this is the fashion these days, even for horror. Uh, content warning. Um, this is really about, like, nihilistic uh, self-loathing and loathing of the entire world. Uh, there's snuff films. There's uh, really unfortunate content. Um, and it is it is probably high in the scale of darkness um in a variety of ways i'm trying to think of all of it uh uh references to climate change references to uh anxiety about like just the world at large um and uh it's it's a lot of very broad stuff honestly okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just blanket trigger warnings for anybody. Um, yes. This is a horror reading. Mm -hmm. um, we're probably going to swear. And um, mention things are that will make you uncomfortable. So if that's something you're not really interested in, um, by all means, we will not take offense. Just scroll away. Um, and I will I will leave this to you now. Okay. All right. Perfect. Nice seeing you. All right. And I'm going to try to figure out how to get myself off. Oh, wait. All right. That was that was a way to exit. Okay. So, threefold.wmv. I am wallowing again in existential dread when I notice this, that the sole source of light in my room is the blue white glow from my computer screen. It's been dark for well over a year, or well over an hour, but that fact didn't jump out at me until now. If I turn the light switch on, I'd only see the uncleansed rot of my apartment in addition to the heavy sweat smell. A message notification distracts me. Sputnik Crest. About to send you something NSFL. Not at work? Forgotten Orchard. How audacious of you to assume I have a job. Sputnik Crest. K sent threefold.wmv. You aren't going to get mopey about this one. Forgotten Orchard. Mopey? You always seem like you feel sorry for the victim, but you watch these anyway. Forgotten Orchard. You don't feel anything for the victim? Sputnik Crust. Lol, no, I think I'm a literal psycho. TBH, I watch stuff. I watch this stuff, so I don't do it. You know when you're watching kink porn and you're not really into it, but you need something hard to get off when you're just watching? Forgotten Orchard. There are so many reasons I'm glad I don't know you IRL. Sputnik Crest. Lol, I asked you a question, though. Forgotten Orchard. In case you haven't noticed, we're in the middle of an apocalypse. Diseases and disasters everywhere. COVID was a teaser. I'm waiting for the first country to run out of water. And I can't distract myself from it because my own personal life also fucking sucks. So I just want to watch someone who's worse off than me. I want to feel what they feel and then know once the video is over that it's just a video I watched. That's all. Sputnik Crust. Sorry I asked. JFC. Well, fine. LMK, what do you think? I close the window and move the cursor to open threefold.wmv. A naked teenage boy is tied into a chair outdoors and at night. At least, I think he's a teenager. The video is black and white handheld camera footage as if whoever filmed this had never heard of the 21st century, so his facial features are unclear. There are tree branches above him, and the video's frame rate turns their movement in the wind into twitchy jerking. At first, I worry that's going to be, that it's going to be another molestation video. After those got repetitive, after those got repetitive enough to stop scratching the itch, the only thing they would evoke was the existential void of watching the horrific and knowing that you felt nothing. Three cloaked figures approach from the front and sides. Their movements are precise, synchronized, choreographed. The camera angle does not allow their faces to be seen beneath their hoods. The one with his back to the screen speaks first in static murder murmurs. The video's sound quality is terrible. Oddly enough, though, there are subtitles. I label him the Eternal King. Capitalized black box captions transcribe the speaker's words. He who dies the threefold death for the land. Who speaks with me? 
The man on the left waves his hands, more static. I speak with you, I who bring yet another death. I speak with you, I who bring the third. That must be the one on the right. More static follows, and now I really can't tell who's speaking. We come, for the world is overtaken by pestilence, by famine, by war, by the oncoming death of all. We come to kill the king so as to save the land. Let all who would object abstain, but they shall not prevent this. In death, he becomes king eternal. The boy writhes in stop motion. The chair rocks. A rope that had blended in with the gray scale now becomes visible through its bouncing. It runs from his neck to a tree branch. A noose. As the three figures step forward, the camera zooms out. The chair is on a raised platform over water. They must be in a swamp? The boy shakes and wobbles as the screen freezes and tears, his screams so low quality that they sound as if underwater. The first cloaked man grabs the boy's head and tilts it back to force him to drink from a goblet. When he steps away, the boy sputters before a foamy mass bulges from his lips. The second man stabs the boy with a knife, then withdraws it. Gray-black fluid leaks from the wound as the boy's mouth froths. The third hangs back and stomps on the platform. A trapdoor beneath the boy falls away. Frothing, bleeding, he falls until the rope goes taut, bounces slightly, and shakes for a moment before going still. The man with the knife cuts the rope, and the boy falls into the swamp. Then all three speak in unison. And so he becomes king eternal. The captions read. The video ends. I imagine living so short a life only to be abducted, tied to a chair in the woods, having insane cultists rant at me before I am stabbed, poisoned, and hanged all at once, right before I'm dumped in a bog. Those could be my last moments, a flurry of confusion, terror, and pain with no comfort before the end. I thank God for all the things I have taken for granted. This could still happen to me, but it is not, and I am alive. There are Discord notifications. Ta-da. You're muted. But um, <laughs> that was great. I thought it read really well. Thank you. Yeah. So where did the um, where did the inspiration, the idea of this story come from? Um. So first things first. Uh, that is a real ritual. Um, mm -hmm. at least it's it's alleged to be in pre-Christian Britain. Okay. Um, it was a, it's been adapted into a lot of Arthurian stories. The idea of a king who has to die to restore the world. Um, actually, they recently dug up a lot of kings killed by by druids in from swamps. Oh. In uh, yeah, in in Great Britain, and there was a whole exhibit of like dead sacrificed kings. From I think Ireland actually I, I should say I, I think I need to be more specific I think from Ireland, okay. um, yeah. So it's a real ritual, uh, and I'm fascinated by it precisely because um, I I tend to be a catastrophizer. That's like where I identify with this character. I don't watch snuff films, um, but like, <laughs> thank I, you, you know, for clarifying I, that. I, I might I might as well say it. Uh, I. I understand why you would, because I watch horror movies, right? I watch the most wor the worst horror movies I can possibly find. I, I search them out because they are bad. I draw the moral line in the sand of like I won't watch um, things that are real because someone like was hurt in that. But yeah. if it's fake, if no one was actually hurt, I will deliberately watch the worst things that I possibly can on purpose. Um, and uh, I understand the comfort of that. Um, I understand the reason to do it. Um, and I just feel like uh, when you get to the story's conclusion, um, there's there's almost this element of really just fucked up escapism to it, sort of. Yeah. like I, I, I don't I don't defend it as as right, but like, given the anxiety that I've had about some of these topics, I, like, you know, I don't know. I really like horror where the main character transcends themselves. Yeah. 
I, I don't know. I find that really interesting. Very cool. No, I like that. Do you have any like specific writing rituals that you get into when you're doing something? I was asked this question recently. And okay. when I was asked the question, the person asking it to me said, you know, I like to sit down and go to a coffee shop, which is my writing zone. And I was listening to this person. I'm like, man, that is such a good idea. I should do that um, because I don't have any writing rituals. I've written entire novels without writing rituals. I just tell myself I need to write a thousand words a day. And then because I'm pig headed, I do it. Um, like that well, is a ritual. You just making yourself do it. Yeah. Yeah. It. My writing ritual is procrastinating. Oh, okay. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. That's, that's acceptable. That's, that's a lot of people's writing ritual. So you're not alone. Right. Yeah, exactly. So forcing yourself to do it, like, and there are people like I could never go to a coffee shop and write because it would be too just unless I had headset on that was blasting something that was so loud. So I couldn't get distracted by everything else. Like there's no way that I could write in public. So the argument that I have heard for it, and this is a really good argument and I believe it, I just haven't adopted it, is that... Uh, yes. If you, yeah, if you sit at your computer, what do you do at your computer? You know, what are, what are all the things that you do at your computer, at your desk, at home? You know, like, like imagine the list of those things. I can't. And yeah, you are sitting at that computer at the desk at home. You are now in the zone for every single one of those things. Like you're in the zone to play video games. You're in the zone to chat to your friends. You're in the yeah. zone to send emails. If you create another space for yourself that is just a writing zone, and that's all that you do there, that's the only thing you do, then your your mind won't go to the other places when you're there. That's the argument I've heard for it. Okay. I feel like that's an amazing argument and one that I'm going to try to make myself do. Yeah, it doesn't need to be a coffee shop, but maybe, I don't know if you have I would probably do a room. library. We've got a really awesome library that's very quiet. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. cool. Well, thank you so much for getting into that with me and for reading your story. So your story, again, is a part of this amazing collection from Beyond the Threshold. Um, it's one of uh, 12 books. If you want to, 12 stories, <laughs> you say books. If you want to read it, we've got an ebook and paperback. You can get it through uh, ebook through Amazon. It is on Kindle Unlimited, so it's exclusive for ebook there. But paperback anywhere. You can even buy it through our Erie River shop, which is at erieriverpublishing.com. So, yeah. And you can also pick up the swaggy beanie or toque if you're Canadian. Oh, my gosh. That's the coolest. But but we have to be Canadian? No. I ship oh, to the okay. States. Okay. I was worried this is that also I'm... available in a winter book box. So if anybody would like to buy themselves a Christmas present with four gifts, that can be in it. Oh, Just heads up. Is... It's brand new on my website. Is the uh is the underground themed book in that? Um it probably will be. Uh... From... Okay, then you could read it. Calls from below. Me. It calls from below. Then if that's if that's the case, you could read two from me. It calls from below. Yeah. Ooh. I'm in that that's... one as well. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I love that one. That one's doing really well. Well, thank you so much. It's so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to put you uh, under the street, like in the green room, and we're going to say hello to HPL next. Uh, but again, thank you so much. Um, and goodbye. <laughs> Um, we have a Josiah that said, hi, I'm so sorry I missed that. So if anyone has any comments or questions while we're going through, feel free to put it through. We were having some volume issues, um, with HPL where we're getting a lot of feedback. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put him on, but keep him on mute for a second, say hi, and then let him just go onto the solo screen so that he can read, um, uh, his stories. Okay, so just hold on one second. I'm bringing them on, on. and hopefully everything will be everything fine. We'll be fine. See, so that's, that's it. Okay. okay. Well, well, I'm gonna push. I'm gonna push. <laughs> I couldn't hit mute fast enough. Um, okay, so we've got your story in here. Um, your story. I apologize. I should have 
memorizing things for me just is never going to work. I'm going to let you tell you your story. <laughs> um, and uh, if you want to do a setup to it, let us know. But either way, um, when you want me to come back on the screen, just wave or say, I'm ready and I will come back. So have a great, have a great show and I will talk to you soon. I'm going to unmute you. Okay. This is, uh, my name's John DeWater and my story as a part of this great anthology is called Of Men, Miles Davis and Madness. Um, I'm not sure there's really a lead into uh, the, the inspiration for this because often this, what happens with these particular stories is that I begin them and then there are bits and pieces that since that come up during the day after I've written down some things and I just try to incorporate those and then take off with, with them. And that's sort of where this came from. And this is a little bit lighter in tone than Jonathan's was, but uh, you know, it's made it to the volume and it has some interesting stuff in it. And I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and the, the idea of Miles Davis came from jazz being um, a way of ordering the universe and bringing order to the universe. Um, and, and, and then the madness part is just, you know, when you touch Lovecraftian stuff, you're bound to things happen to human beings that shouldn't happen. And that's sort of what this story is about. So let me begin reading it. And I've got, I'm using my phone and I've got my other hand, uh, the book. So I'll try to be as smooth as possible. My name is Lamont, Lamont Buford. And this is my journey to enlightenment, my path to piety. No, scratch that. I'm not sure what the hell I was doing at first or even now. At one point, I was quite content with the contrived and the medi mediocre. Something changed at some juncture when I, could, when I couldn't tell you, neither could I explain why. I just started jotting down notes here and there for prosperity's sake. And in case I want to turn my experiences later into a book, calling it the Alden Void. That last one I read off the back of a book in a horror section of a local secondhand bookstore. So I copped it for my own. No one remembers who the author was that came up with that phrase anyway. Or did I see that title on an album cover? I set up a comfortable recliner in the center of a pentagram I chalked out on the floor of my basement. I mixed a little bit of my blood in a bowl into which I dipped the chalk, but not too much blood. I'm a bit squeamish at being my own and in limited supply. It had a chance to dry before I used it or another piece of chalk, one of its blood brothers, to keep my pentagram unbroken. I think that's how the thing is supposed to be kept up. I thought long and hard about which of the Countless gods, demigods, etc. I might summon to my side or summon to my side. Who am I kidding? Summoning to my aid. When I awoke at night, I wondered which flavor of divinity might help me. When I was at work, the mind numbing routine allowed me to occasionally surf the astral plane in a sort of out of body experience. As I glanced around in that state to get an idea of who or what was out there to tell you how routine my job is. When I was off work, I spent all my time in any book on the subject I could find, as long as it was in my native tongue, checking out divine persons, much like the way my father looked in a Montgomery Ward catalog for things he thought he couldn't live without. I hadn't mastered much more than English, and some of my learned friends would say I hadn't truly really mastered that language either. I was tired of living without divine assistance, it seemed like everybody else was around me was living off something, somebody or something else assistance in the form of a check, in the form of a free clinic, in the form of cards they could exchange for food and whatever. But that always assistance always came with strings attached, like bait on a hook from a divine fisherman someplace. I didn't want to feel, be, feel obligated to anyone. I wanted to be my own boss 
to be in charge of my own destiny. I didn't want to feel like I owed anything to anybody. Even if this was just an elusive daydream, a phantasm that haunted me. I wanted to live on the divine dole, but not suckle some bureaucrat's teeth. So I worked out the idea of getting divine assistance. That was my chosen way out of the mess I'd made out of my life. How, how could I alone myself pull myself up by my own bootstraps when gravity was involved? What were the qualifications for my would-be rescuer? A god or goddess or something in between, one of those whichever ones truly existed. That was a starting point for me. Next, it would have to be someone or something I could work with. I used the words to work with rather than work for. I had my fill of working for others in my first 37 years of living. They felt like they owned you. I didn't want any deity that felt like they owned me. I don't know if a divine presence exists that wouldn't want ownership as part of the bargain or a clause in an agreement that they might bring up later. I'm no lawyer, nor do I play one on TV. So maybe they'll eliminate a lot of the top gun deities, the types that can really turn a person's life around and take a person in a better direction. That's kind of change is scary. And I'm not like, I don't like, I like some of the aspects of my life the way they are right now. What was I to do? I tried the normie route looking for an esoteric yellow pages that I could quickly thumb through and find a deed of the, of the day I could easily reach. Strewn in heaps atop my basement table, there lay an electric, elect, electric assortment of mystical volumes, fairy folklore uh, tomes, sundry cook's books, and other odd references. Many of them were in old dead languages that even with the help of re reincarnation, I couldn't learn in a hundred lifetimes. I read a couple of the books that I sort of could get my mind wrapped around. There was the Scandinavian Graskinian or Grayskin, a sorcerer's tome whose reputation was as notorious in dark circles as the Aramaic version of Ludic Prim's dreaded de Vermis Mysterious. In the lesser known uh, Skalak version, a soccer recounted the deeds of a Viking wizard, one Sigurd the Bold, who sought out among the many Norse raids across the known world a path to immortality on behalf of his sovereign. And maybe I'll stop right there if that's five minutes. Like I said, this is more of a lighthearted but still touching on the weird, which is what H.P. Lovecraft is all about. And that's basically where I began a lot of my journey back in 2013, when I began to write uh, nonfiction essays for the Lovecraft easing. I wrote 24 different essays about H.P. Lovecraft himself and about various subjects. And so out of that particular um, knowledge of the man, reading his words seeped into me and hopefully have seeped into the uh, pages of my story. And I'm really, really happy to be a part of the From Beyond the Threshold series. And take it away. You're on. Sorry, I was trying to add myself to the stream, but it was being um, really awkward. <laughs> well, thank you so much for reading that and giving us a little bit of an insight of how you were introduced to HP and um, your your history with the, the cosmic horror um, genre itself. Is there um, art? Oh. Sorry, I lost my question because <laughs> I think you answered it. What about your writing rituals? Do you have any sort of writing rituals? Okay. What I do, and this is what I found it, what I began this year to do is basically I spend a half an hour, I get up, I eat my breakfast, uh, get on the computer, spend about a half an hour writing to 45 minutes. I get about 300 words at that particular pop. 
and I just do that seven days a week. Uh, and usually after I do the writing five days a week, I go to my normal nine to five job. And then on the weekend, I spend more time on it where I'll maybe do a thousand words or something like that. But it's just getting down and sitting in front of the computer and doing the writing because I spend about an hour a night on social media advertising uh, the various books I'm involved with. So those are my ways of doing things. Um, it just, you know, you, you got to get started and you can't base it upon inspiration. Inspiration comes from perspiration for me. Yeah, it's just a lot of people find it about being consistent, making sure they're putting in the effort and putting in the time. Um, and just getting in front of the computer or whoever, however they write. Some people are hand writers, right? So um, it's good to, to know that like that, that works for you, which is amazing. Cause I know sometimes there's some people where they get in the computer and it's just like, if they don't have something specific they're writing for. Luckily, if you get started on something, an idea will continue and a story will want to tell itself. I mean, that's how did this, this one drew out of, because you wouldn't think about writing an HPL horror story of, that had comic relief in it, but this does have that. And so this is how it came out. Um, there are some times that that doesn't work out and you have to, you'll have a story set aside for a while until you come to the ending you're supposed to have. But I'm, I'm really trying to work on turning over a short story a month just for the yeah. this one yeah. thing. No, it's great. No, it's great. Well, thank you so much for coming and introducing us to your story. Again, the story is in this one right here from Beyond the Threshold. We've got 12 unique stories in here. Um, and it uh, you can get ebook um, available through Amazon. It is Kindle Unlimited, but paperbacks you can order it from your local bookstore. You can get it our our website itself at Erie Publishing, Erie River Publishing .com. Um, uh, Or you can even request your library. We do have uh, some libraries that hold it and they don't ask to see if your local library can hold it for you. So thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna put you down the screen and then I'll bring you up at the end. Right now we're going to um, put on JL Royce. If they're ready, I believe they're ready. <laughs> Hello. Oh, wait, you are muted too. Oh, we've got a kitten. Hello, kitten. Oh, I can't unmute you. I think you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Locally muted myself. There you go. Just in case you opened me up while I had a cat purring loudly into this. <laughs> so um, I don't think I will ever complain about a cat purring loudly on the screen. <laughs> so um, I want to thank you, Michelle, for the invitation and for the uh, support in getting my story into this fine volume and the other authors who showed up tonight and Tim Mendez. I, I was looking forward to you know, some maybe spell casting at each other or something tonight, but I guess that's not going to happen. I so. think he's hoping to set up one another time next week. He just, he had no time before Halloween. Um, so I think he's going to be trying to set up another one. So maybe you might be able to join that one. That'd be great. Yeah. So, um, yes, I'm Jail Royce. I've been writing the uh, last five years or so publishing, um, science fiction and horror macabre fiction is what i mostly called it uh if you think raul dahl um john chamberlain uh alfred hitchcock that sort of stuff um, oh, awesome. it can have horror aspects but it's yeah. it's not um it, it's more twists and and um you know what fate does to a person so um <laughs> but i i particularly enjoy cosmic horror i have for many years, um, I think um, H.P. Lovecraft's language appealed to me when I was a teenager and uh, stuck with me. And I uh, really uh, wanted to explore that that world, but uh, more the um, the philosophy or the, you know, 
malignant philosophy of uh, cosmic horror, uh, which is this uh, sense of is, is humanity infinitesimal and insignificant? And are there cosmic forces at work? Yeah. And um, one aspect of that, which uh, is explored in my story, Corpora, uh, has to do with uh, the idea that perhaps we aren't the accident of evolution, but that something has interfered with our evolution. And of course, um, optimistic religions feel that's a benign creator who, who influenced evolution or created us directly. But um, in, uh, in the Lovecraft mythos, there are creatures that have been engineered by other older, more powerful beings to be their slaves. Yeah. And um, one of the themes I have in several of my stories is this idea that we're just waiting to be activated, as it were, uh, into that role. And so um, you get folks like Ligotti who, you know, say, oh, woe is me. I'm a conscious being and I know I'm going to die and, and so forth. Um, I, I object to that characterization because there's, there's a nobility in the struggle. And mm -hmm. in the case of this cosmic horror, the struggle is, uh, are, we, are we destined to be slaves or to be meat or something at uh, you know, the behest of some cosmic beings, yeah. or do we have a chance of fighting back? Um, so, um, I love that. Did you want to get right into um, your story? I'll leave, leave you, you alone. Right? Yeah, if you're quite tired of me, I never jabbering. Let's continue this. So, um, my interests include neuroscience, and I've, I've spent a lot of my career in corporations. Uh, so. The setting of this story is a, a corporation, a okay. startup, tech, high tech, and some of the language may be unfamiliar to, to some, but you can Google it all. So I'm going to just read a, uh, the beginning of this story and um, leave you with that rather than spoiling too much of it. So with my That's voice. Perfect. So um, a note, it's told in five sections, and uh, my affectation here is that the, the first section in the story is the last section of the story, which is five. So okay. we begin with the end. Perfect. Section five, launch. All right. uh, I will leave you alone. Just let me wave, wave me on when you're ready to, uh, oh, for me to join. Sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. So Corpora, a jail Royce, uh, section five, launch. There's blood on my hands, not my own. The pain, though, is mine, drowning out the inner voice, permitting me to leave the message. The inner voice, the wordless bidding, subtle as water over stone and quite as destructive, seeks a crevice through which to seep into my voice. The words twist in my mouth, squirming like maggots, nauseating, resisting order. I squeeze the dusky blisters on my arm until the pain makes my vision ripple, but at least the words resolve. When I've recorded all I can, I'll attempt to end what she's begun. Section one, development. My name is Carrie Garrison, and the story begins the day I met Dr. Myra Rickmott, Rickmore, excuse me. She was stalking the stage at her TED Talk, a double doctorate Silicon Valley rock star, spinning her vision of a world liberated in an 18-minute pitch for her passion, free speak. Before we allow technology to rob us of our human freedoms, we must harness it to protect those freedoms even as humanity evolves relentlessly into homo cyberneticus. I give you free speak. It was neurotech embedded in the language centers, always on, transforming speech, not just between natural languages, but speech with provenance, optionally using a novel, highly secure audio coding. Politicians hated her on the left and the right, calling her capitalist, globalist, anarchist. She was an atheist promoting religious freedom, a feminist who believed in sex robots, a homeless billionaire, Anyone with a vested interest in the geopolitical status quo felt threatened by her message of humanity and worldwide, unfettered, unfiltered,
communion. I was never particularly political. Perhaps that was part of Myra's appeal for me, the promise of real-time provenance. The lies would still be there, only traceable and disprovable. Without the lies, what would be left of public conversation? Perhaps football and sex. Watching her shine on that stage like a supernova, I fantasized what it would be like to cleave to that naked light, feel the flames, scream in joy on the pyre. Yes? It was the meet and greet, and I'd arrived at the front of the line. Myra sat behind a fortress of books, her books, pen poised over a copy of the latest. Oh, uh, my name is Carrie Garrison. I struggled to gather my thoughts as her pen moved. No, I, I mean, I'm not here to buy your book. Her eyebrows rose like pale knives above the dark frames of her glasses and with them, the tip of the pen. Or on second thought, sure, I, I've read it already online, but yeah, I'd, I'd love a signed paper copy, of course. We also offer NFT signatures for EPUBs. She tucked a stray blonde strand behind her ear and glanced off, frowning. You're a linguist? Evolution of cultural memes? Paradigm shift. Her glasses were networked and I stood before her naked, professionally speaking. My meager life's work exposed. Yes, and I came to talk with you about... Someone behind me in the line of syncophants cleared their throat. Perhaps this isn't the time, I said. One sentence, Myra said and stared at me, lips curving into a smile as thin as her champagne lipstick. Tease me. I swallowed and said, the solution to universal human communion lies in the past, the deep past of human culture, regressing our natural languages back to a common primordial, thanks. Myra glanced off again and my phone rumbled against my cheek. See my calendar page, set up an appointment soon. She frowned at the book, added a few more words and propelled it across the desk with a shove. Keep it, I can afford it more than you. Full disclosure. It stung. Thanks, and I, Dr. Re Myra Rickmore, dismissed me with a twitch of her head. Move along. I nodded, mumbled my thanks again, and scuttled off. On the train back to my shared apartment, I opened Freedom to Speak and read the hastily scrawled dedication for Carrie. Call. P.S. You have spinach in your teeth. M. Scene change. The day I started at Adaptive Research was special and not in a good way. The Chinese dev team, before they were fired, dubbed it Zheng Dao Zhi Yi, Night of the Long Knives. It was night there, and though I didn't wield a knife myself, my appearance was inextricably linked with the sudden deep layoffs in development. What I had done was infect Myra with my vision of a core language for free speak, independent of any speaker's language. That course correction tipped the ship of state and tossed a lot of folks comfortably ensconced in their deck chairs overboard. Myra axed half of the NLP team and discarded their inchoate attempt at machine translation. The rest she deemed could be re-educated re by me. We addressed the home team in a face-to-face -face meeting, not remote. This required presence. We are not translating English to Russian or Spanish to French. We're recoding natural languages, all of them into a deeper form, a pseudocode and back again. Aware that their employment past the end of the day depended upon it, they feigned some level of enthusiasm. But soon Myra reached them, echoing some truth they had felt unrealized. We shall restore the human tongue to its pristine state before the Tower of Babel. She penetrated their minds like water seeping relentlessly into every crevice of a rock. Given real-time translation to and from our universal core language, how do we secure communications? Myra gestured and I activated the wall screen. We're exploring bioelectronics and nanotech implementations, said Myra. A group can share a session of translated speech, optionally encrypted, preserving all the qualities that make an individual speech unique, all the emotional cues, while securing the symbolic content. To anyone not sharing the session, the speech sounds like babies babbling. There was a chuckle, rolled eyes. Myra noted the developer. It was their last day. Scene change. I wasn't popular, not that I craved company, but I didn't appreciate being treated like a plague carrier. 
No one was outright hostile, and as the months passed, the attitude relaxed. The honeymoon with my job and Myra was lapsing. Her interest in, my ex in me extended no further than the recoder, and her critique of our slow progress was becoming strident. Ned was the only minion who offered me some token friendship. The developers worked in a forest of curving paths and randomly placed green space oases. The arrangement was intended to promote spontaneous creative conversations, but it was still a warren of cubicles, simply more confusing to navigate. Two months into my employment, I was walking past a workstation when the wall screen caught my eye. What's this? Ned started as if caught watching porn, his round face a pale moon rising over a voluminous blue shirt. The video on his desk screen looked rather boring. A half dozen nerds around a table rolling odd dice. Oh, Dr. Garrison, I... He mumbled an explanation, something I can't recall, because I was captivated by his wall screen, a flow of graceful script that text in an unfamiliar language, and I can recognize a lot of languages. What is this? I repeated. It's, it's from a defaced 11th century French grimoire, the original text of a palimpsest containing a transcript dating from the Sumerian Empire 3,000 years earlier. The Sumers believed it came from, what are you doing with it? We're, uh, you're pursuing ancient languages to their roots, but there are hints of even older sources. Apocrypha like this? My gaze wandered his little space. Gaming figurines, screensavers of obscure Star Wars characters, and several quote-unquote ancient texts of fictional origin didn't inspire confidence, but I tried to be patient. You know, a lot of these ancient mysteries are probably hoaxes. Still, the elegance of the script held me in thrall. I know, said Ted, but I found more examples using image search against every online library I could reach. His sausage fingers tapped daintily at a too small folding keyboard and brought up a database. All of these? I scanned the list, skeptical. Mayan? Show me. The Codex Diabolicus, rescued, allegedly, from Diego de Landa and smuggled back to Spain from 16th century Yucatan by an insane Jesuit mystic. Academic opinion was that the Jesuit had concocted it from his mad visions and forged it onto a scraped Mayan scroll. There's a Spanish commentary contemporary with the discovery, said Ted. Ned. It's pretty consistent with the Dresden Codex and other sources, establishing its age at least, until you hit this patch. It was another scrap of the same elegant script found in Sumer. The Spanish related that the Mayans claimed to have received revelations in the time before their gods arose. From? Ned shrugged. None of the sources could say. The closest a few translations came to is to mention ancestors or maybe old ones. Have you analyzed the proximity of concepts in this proto-language to modern languages? I don't have the resources. He looked sheepish. I'm supposed to be working on unit tests for the virtual assistant, but I've always wanted to contribute to the NLP side of the project. I made a mental note to speak with Ted's manager to fire them. Not anymore, I said, and pulled out my phone. You're working for me on the recoding module for the NLP. I stroked and tapped, and now you have the resources. Pursue this. You'll have all the cloud ML you can use. And Ned glowed. Awesome, thank you. I'll have to assign you to a manager. Uh, report on this proto-language directly to me. I hadn't delivered the promised core representation for free speak, and all the top-down derivations starting from modern languages and seeking common ground were failing to converge in a useful, concise form. So I was a little desperate. First report tomorrow midday, I said, and retreated into the snaking hallway. Ned was already crouched over his screen, setting up analyses. Ned didn't deserve what happened to him. Be careful what you wish for. And we'll stop there. So thank you, Michelle, for the Hello. invitation. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for coming. Um, it's, uh, it's always great to hear how we can give all these different, so we can get all these different types of stories and um, things like that with just one type of 
theme yeah. or um, yeah. like we did a, a horror, a, a folk horror column. We got so many interesting and unique different stories. And the same thing with this, like we have stories that get very um, in your head stories that are web based. Like there's, it's just really interesting to see how everyone takes the, the theme and runs with it. Um, mm -hmm. What was your inspiration for this one specifically? Well, I, I think it was uh, the neuroscience side of it. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to um, speak to that, the feasibility of protecting speech. I, I'd, uh, I'd had this concept of um, uh, a language called crypt in my mind from other stories I'd written uh, that would be um, indecipherable to people who didn't share a password, as it were. Yeah. So you could have a private conversation in the middle of a crowd. And uh, I wanted to explore what that could mean and, and, um, and what might be subverting that, I guess. So. Very cool. This is what I came loved up. it. Well, thank you so much. And again, if anyone wants to um, dive deep into that story, mm -hmm. you can find it here in From Beyond the Threshold. Again, it's one of a dozen stories that are in um, the collection itself. And they are all curated by um, Tim Mendes. And uh, cover, well, not cover. Well, I did do the cover too. So we got some interesting, fun little, it's just, it's a pretty book. I like nice it. layout. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I did want to mention I'm one of those pen people. You are a pen person, eh? I like it. So, you know, you don't have, need a special place or a computer. You take this to wherever you go. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's quite handy. <laughs> well, it, 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 but inescapable. Right? Yes, yeah, very true. Very true. Okay, I'm going to bring our other two authors up and you guys can, if anyone has any questions, please uh, put them in the comments. We don't have much time left, but we're going to let everyone let us know where to find them on social media. Um, and if they have anything coming out or if any books that they want to tell us about to please tell us about them. So um, Jonathan Hart, you're coming on next. And then um, we've got, here we go. Excellent. Okay. So again, if anyone has any questions, please put them down there. Um, but uh, JL, let's start with you since we just saw you. Please tell us where can we find you on social media? How do we find your stuff? And do you have anything fun coming out? Sure. Uh, if you look for J-L-R-O-Y-C-E, uh, you can find that on Facebook, the social media platform that was Twitter, uh, Blue Sky, <laughs> and Instagram. So um, uh, I'm not going to rattle off all those things. And there's a, a domain, www.jlroyce.com that takes you to Amazon where you can find a whole bunch of anthologies and magazines with my stories. I don't have any novels out there. Uh, the novels beyond the stage of this, but not quite the stage of this. In other words, in editing. So, thanks. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> um, all right, Jonathan, what about you? Where can we find you and what do you have for us? So, I theoretically have a Twitter, but I'm I'm terrible at it. And I also don't even understand that uh, its name changed because I just said that. <laughs> um, so, I, I, I tend to really be bad with social media. Um, but the big thing I have... Uh, the big place you can find me is I do have an Amazon author page. I, I committed to making one of those. It has all the anthologies I've been published in, at least that you can buy on Amazon. And the big one that's coming up is uh, my story, Ants, in uh, Fable, an anthology of sci-fi, horror, and the supernatural. Um, that is coming up in November 30th. They just delayed it, apparently. Uh Anyway, Ants is one of my proud, like I am some of the, one of my proudest stories is in a story that I am the most proud of. Um, Excellent. I, I'm really looking forward to it. Is it about ants, like your relation or ants, the ant bug? Ants, the bug. Um, 
Yeah, I already did a spider story with Erie River, so I'm doing an <laughs> ants story with fables. Yeah, it feels like very on theme. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, what about you, Mister De Lauder? Let's see if I can unmute you or if you've muted yourself. Whoops. There we go. Okay. Um, my social media is basically what you see on the screen. Uh, I'm on uh, Instagram at HPL under, uh, underscore J DeLauder on uh, Twitter, where I've just reached 10,000 uh, followers, uh, which is cool. Um, and also, uh, I've got a Facebook page, again, with the same HPL. And then uh, also on Amazon, it has a collection of the works that I've done, either like uh, J other people has talked about having appearances in anthologies, or there's a few books that I've got, such as uh, a book about H.R. Uh, Giger and H. Uh, P. Lovecraft, which is a good seller. As far as what's coming up soon, um, there's a lot of things in the fire. One of the ones that will be coming out is called Beneath the Mountains of Madness, and that will be in a Dick uh, Dixonian or Dickerson, you know, back during the time of uh, the guy who wrote uh, The Christmas Carol, uh, but steampunk. And it'll be like a steampunk fantasy. So I'm really looking forward to then that comes out. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for, for watching. And if you're watching it later, um, thank you. <laughs> Again, you can grab this book, uh, Kindle and Kindle Unlimited on Amazon for an ebook, or you can pick up a physical copy at, at your local bookstore. You can do it through Amazon, or you can even order it at erieriverpublishing.com, where we have most of our newest releases up available. We have book boxes that are going to be available if anyone wants any holiday gifts for people. We also have swag, like this cool hat, and I believe I have a mug. Not the fuck off. I could put that mug up there. But, um, the first mug I had. Anyways, thank you everyone for coming. It's been great seeing you um, and buy the book. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. You're welcome. Thanks so much for coming.